The Iron Curtain, impenetrable back in 72. Leonid Brezhnev's Soviet was mighty then, iron-fisted. The Czechs learned that in 68. Cold days in the coldest war, when Soviet tanks crushed reform and confirmed the power of the Red Empire. Power that extended even into space. And anything seemed possible in those heady days, from the viewing stand near the Kremlin Wall in Red Square, when detente, glasnost, and perestroika were just words. The common ground was shared geography and mutual love of a game. We struggled as the 70s began. The FLQ crisis. Soldiers in Montreal. Separation was the issue. We faced a 72 fall election, preoccupied with unity, questioning even back then our identity. A lot of enthusiasm, not only for sports, but for politics. Politics and sport were about to take an unforgettable journey. It began in Prague, a hotbed of hockey. A simple announcement started it all. Our arrangement with the National Hockey League through Hockey Canada and with the National Hockey League Players Association through Mr. Eagleson is that they will make the best possible Canadian players available in order to play the best possible Russian players. The unknown. Aeroflot Flight 301. They arrived shrouded in mystery. Alan Eagleson was there to greet them. Strange names, unfamiliar faces, lambs to the slaughter. Our boys were waiting, hockey's finest, focused on the task at hand. Affirmation of the obvious. The faithful gathered in the carnival air, savoring the pre-storm lull. Our game was coming home. Four games here, four games there. Team Canada, unique name, unique sweaters, unique series. The crowd assembled. Our rakish prime minister, a recent hockey convert, presided over the ceremonial face-off, which underscored our belief we were invincible. I was gonna win the face-off. To me, it was, you win this, let them know, hey, we're not fooling around here. I remember turning back in Gary Bergman's face. <laughs> he had this pumpkin head, and it was his face smiling, and he, you won that draw, Phil. <laughs> I said, no, I don't. Roll call. Names without meaning or history. Audaciously sharing forum ice with our awesome hockey arsenal. Number 13, Boris Mikhailov. In Montreal, when we lined up on the blue lines, I was terrified. And when they scored two early goals, I thought, it's over. We're beaten. We're dead. Eight time zones away, Russian fans, anxious, nervous, expectant. 8.15, electricity, the most anticipated hockey summit ever, mere minutes away. International hockey traditions honored. Gifts exchanged. The two-man referee system and the third period end change. To further enhance the spectacle, a legend stepped from retirement. Foster Hewitt would provide the words. Brian Conacher, the color. Their pre-game concern, the names of the strangers. Finally, at 8.29, Petrov and Esposito skated forward. And the game is underway with Petrov having cleared it into the Canadian zone. Canada clear on the boards, but not out. It's Bergman coming up now with a pass out to center ice. Esposito going up over the line. I was so hyped. Right it was incredible. Board. I hadn't Bergman been that nervous. I can't remember when. The There's Bergnoia. There's a pass with Plato. Bait stop. Here's a shot right in front. Let it go. Well, Esposito has scored for Canada. Confirmation. One shot. One goal. It was that easy. I defy anybody on that team to tell me that on that bench that we weren't going to walk over these guys like crazy. Six minutes later. And Parker playing up. It's back to Henderson. He scores! Two nothing. All was right in Canada. It was very, very important for me 
to put these Russians in their place. I mean, they were the big bad Russians and they were, this was, I mean, Canada, this is the one thing that we are the best at. Hockey's best, that was the idea. Yet old NHL rivalries were hard to bridge. Uh, we did like each other very much. Uh, and it was a quite of uh, an adjustment to, to do with those guys. But that hurdle was easily overcome. The Maple Leaf broke down the barriers. The Red Maple Leaf, and when they signed up for Team Canada, they were teammates. It was like an all-star game when they're friends. Harry Sinden, ex-Bruin coach, came back to guide Team Canada's fortunes. He set up camp in Toronto and began the task of getting his players into shape. He knew conditioning would play a vital role. We had a, a pretty good training camp by our standards. You know, we, we worked a month, we worked as, as hard or harder than we did in our usual NHL training camps. Sinden played for the 58 Whitby Dunlops. They beat the Soviets in the world championships. He, more than anyone, knew the opponent would be ready. Uh, I don't really believe that they believed me that they were gonna meet such a formidable team as the Soviet national team. I never worked that hard since or before, as I did in training camp at that, but mentally, I didn't get myself as prepared as I should have. John Ferguson, retired NHL heavyweight champion, rounded out the coaching staff. The team took a few weeks to prepare. The Soviets worked year round to do the same. The attitude in camp was jovial. The players reasoned that they were far beyond the Soviets in ability, and so they worked hard by NHL standards. But it wasn't all of our best. Bobby Orr with bad knees, Bobby Hull and others signed to the WHA would not play. Still, we were leading 2-0. But the uh, Soviet team sprucing up. Here's a shot, block. Another try, the shot goes wide and bounces over to this side. Vladiev trying to clear to the corner. It's set it right in front, it's score! On that left side, they finally found the corner of the net. Mihailov nearly got loose, gets it over to Petrov, back to Mihailov, right in the clear. Oh, right in, it's score! Petrov getting the rebound. And it's all tied up. Because hockey is so greatly loved by Russians, we felt duty-bound to be competitive against the professionals and to justify their faith in us. That night in Montreal was so beautiful for us. It showed everyone that we were able to compete with the Canadians. Period two, meet Valery Khalamov. He could compete with anybody. Moments later, he struck again. Karlamov, a very tricky player, gets the scores! Karlamov, let a bullet drive, goal! I remember Valeri, what he did on the ice. He was like a slalom skier, only on skates. And he was so elegant and powerful. Something that Ken Dryden found out that night. Karlamov was an outstanding hockey player, probably the best I ever saw. I was proud to be his teammate. He had such talent. Such talent. Kharlamov, Mikhailov, Yakushev, Tretyak, Petrov. Beating Canada's team at Canada's game. But how? Their uniforms, shabby. Their skates, their helmets, well-worn. Their ability, obvious, at least to anyone who watched objectively. They judged us very superficially, without much thought. And it was a big mistake on the part of the Canadians. We could see from their gestures, by the way they acted and the remarks they made during our practice, that they didn't consider us to be worthy opponents. We could hear their laughter. We could all feel it, that arrogance. Arrogant pride before the fall. Four to two, the Soviets in control, beating us on the boards, out hustling us behind the nets out muscling us at every turn. And in the open ice, they showed us moves that had never been seen here before. 
That night, the Soviets were simply strongest, hungriest, slickest, and above all, fastest. Team Canada was dead tired, and there was still a period left to play. We were fooled. I mean, we were extremely fooled and, and stunned and shocked. Their homework was done. Ours wasn't, in spite of the infamous Moscow scouting trip. The scouting report was Bob Davidson, uh, you know, pretty astute hockey man, and his analysis that Yes, they've got a very good hockey club, but their goaltending is relatively weak. The goaltender that was going to play for the, the All-Star team, or the team that was coming to Canada, Trachek, let 11 goals go in. So uh, to make a report on the goaltender, it wasn't very good. <laughs> The report was superficial. Tretiak had announced his marriage just before Davidson arrived with the late Johnny McClellan. Celebrating with friends dulled his reflexes. The Russians played the rest of the angles with their wits. The Canadian scouts said that I was weak. I couldn't stop a beach ball, that they'd easily beat me. Maybe it was a good scouting report, the Canadians saying that I'd be a lightweight. But maybe it was a good trick. Maybe it was a superb trick. We were playing catch up hockey. We needed a spark. Foster, what Team Canada hasn't been able to do in this game is slow down the play. The tempo has been too fast. But in the third period, we came back, led brilliantly by the line of Clark, Henderson, Ellis. After the goal change, the fire died, smothered by fatigue, evident on our bench and where it counted most, on the ice. The Soviet invaders came at Ken Dryden in waves. Lots going in, and and I just remember the feelings of them. I, I felt like a fish on land. I mean, I, I just fell out of it. It was um, it was an awful experience. I mean, it was it was really awful. Yeah. 
station control tanks to the shooting to the stage passing. We got beat by one fine hockey team. Toronto anticipated a more festive mood, but everything was deadly serious now. The Soviets had come to score some goals, win a few games, to prove they belonged. Montreal's 7-3 win changed their mandate. Now they were instructed to win it all. And while they enjoyed Canadian hospitality, they churned inside. The pause in action allowed for some ice breaking, but everyone was obsessed with what had happened. The worst thing is, is to overestimate yourself and underestimate your opposition. They completely underestimated us at the beginning. For them, the series was a novelty, not a serious competition. And they were so certain that they would crush us easily, especially in Montreal. For us, it was perfect. We were ready. We could play our game and let their unprofessional attitude work against them. Canadian national team founder, Father David Bauer, sensed anxiety. Their coaches, Kulagin and Bobrov, struggled with Moscow's new expectations. Out on Carlton Street, fans felt the tension. As they filed into the gardens, it grew. Soon, a sea of faces reflected the shock of our nation, reflected the disbelief of Montreal. We sat nervously waiting. While journalists retracted their blowout predictions, Canadians sifted through the wreckage of game one. The public was totally devastated. They were still in a state of shock. But deep down inside, most of those people, they were scared to death. And uh, so was I. Harry overhauled the lineup. Dryden, unhappy Hadfield, others out. Parise, Tony Esposito, and others in. The team was ready, and so was the Garden's crowd. I was very proud as a Leaf to, uh, to, to be there and, and to uh, hear the support of, 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 the, of the fans that we had there. I think the fans had a lot to do with that game. For us personally, it was difficult on a psychological level to play in their arenas. After all, these Canadian stadiums are two of hockey's greatest temples. Difficult for them, critical for us. A loss here and the series would be over. A total disaster, a national disgrace. In Toronto, things got tougher. Tony Esposito and Tretiak kept the game scoreless into the second period. Then Phil Esposito's odyssey began. Foster Hewitt would come to those words often that September. Phil's September. An excellent job of getting Phil Esposito the puck. Now look at the quick move across the goal mount. And he jams it in the far side. Hockey is punctuated by retribution. Kharlamov made our defense look slow in Montreal. Ivan Kournoye made theirs look ponderous in Toronto. Elation, 2-0 Canada. This lineup worked, and the roadrunner flew. And Cornway is gone, and he breaks in, good position, and he fires a good hard shot to that opening in Tretjak's lane. Ivan Cornway. Ivan Cornway. We had a nickname for him. We called him the train which fit his personal style. He was fast and strong and dangerous. They all had great personal skills and much determination. We never put them down. We respected them. And this game is as different as night and day from the first game in Montreal. They've controlled the game. Control was the key, and Canada's roster additions, the instrument. 
Role players like Black Hawk defenseman Pat Stapleton knew their job and were up to the task. In the gardens, their bench felt the heat of battle. But a penalty to Bobby Clark opened the door, and Alexander Yakushev cut our lead to one. Big Yak, a lanky scoring machine. At home in the slot, just like his Canadian counterpart, Phil Esposito. Seconds later, another power play opportunity. Pat Stapleton, number three, sitting in the penalty box. The next goal would be talked about forever. The point is on the defense. Peter Mahovlich remains out there. There's a pass back to Liapkin over on the far side. That crisscross passing play. They failed to click on that one. Now Shadron getting it back to Liapkin. Over on the far side, right in front of the goal, went wide of the net. Neiman knocked it back to the goal. It rolls off to the side. They failed to clear it out. The point failed to get it away. Then Esposito cleared out. It's a race down with Peter Mahoff. is going in on goal. Right in. To this day, Tretjak still wonders where it went. I remember that goal to this day, each detail, each movement, and I still do not understand how he managed to score. Technically, I played it perfectly and didn't make a mistake. Still, he got the puck past me and scored a very big goal for them. It was like magic. When Peter Mahav scored the goal, that short end of goal, I mean, I got an assist on it, to tell you the truth. I just blasted it out, out of our own zone and off the boards. I picked it up just in, inside our red line and uh, ended up on a one-on-one -on -one situation with a defenseman. I uh, picked up a lot of steam by the time I got to their blue line and felt if I'd take a, a good slap shot, you know, might get a good shot on net. Hesitation by their defenseman. He was lost. Peter was free, raging, and would not be denied. When he put the move on them, on Gusev and then on Tretiak, I just freaked out. I mean, I was, I was yelling like a Banji Indian. Way to go, Peter, you big stiff. <laughs> That's what I kept saying, though. The moment was lost in battle, but Mahovlich picked up the thread in time. 15 years later, I finally got to see it in a video, and uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. <laughs> Who is that guy? Simple answer, one of Toronto's Mahovlich brothers. Nine years younger than brother Frank, the legendary Big M. While Frank was overwhelmed by emotion as the series progressed, this night, he was a predator. And the hometown fans couldn't get enough. He's the rookie out there for the first time. The right foot for Mahavlich scores! Mahavlich! Mike Mahavlich has scored a fourth goal. And both the Mahavlich brothers are dangerous tonight. The whole team was dangerous that night. Despite the finesse of Soviet play, we shut down their attack. What did get through was turned away by Tony O. It was as if Montreal had never happened. A nightmare forgotten. A 4-1 lead. For the moment, Team Canada was inspired. Maybe after the first game, which they lost badly, they got serious about us and began to respect us and our abilities. In the second game, they were much more collected and concentrated. A hockey player can tell things from his opponent's appearance, and I remember looking into their eyes in Toronto and seeing more fire and intensity. It was very clear their expressions had changed. The score changed too, and so did the mood. 
of everyone. Brother Night, Tony and Phil Esposito, game stars. Peter and Frank Mahovlich, game heroes. Finally, the expected high had arrived. But questions for Winnipeg haunted the celebration. Which lineup would play? Which team would show? Toronto's or Montreal's? and snow. It was ours, who we were, who we are. And a world that didn't know much about us knew one thing for certain. We could play hockey better than anyone. Our ribbon of honor stretched all the way to the 50s. Olympic gold, world championships. Like sunrise, victory was a given. 1954, shifting tides. East York's Lindhursts lost 7-2 to the Soviets. We call it a fluke, blind luck. They don't have been playing internationally for five years. Didn't even have an indoor rink. We'd send them a better team, get the trophy back. Unleash the Penticton Vs. The Soviets wilted. Along the way, Hal Tarala took out the Russian rocket, permanently. But Zevold Bobrov would return as a coach in 72. For now, our game was secure. Another shift in the tides, the Olympics. Our permanent gold lost two nothing in a flurry of funny red shirts and even funnier black helmets. Hitting didn't phase them this time. Their first games and our grasp on gold was gone. We've never got it back. There were still moments of glory. In 58, Harry Sinden led the Whitby Dunlops to a decisive world championship victory over them. But our trips to the high spot on the podium would soon end. Maybe that's why Harry treasured the trophy so long ago, at a time when our attention was elsewhere. We had the NHL. A star-studded league of all Canadian boys who dazzled and shone. The world game, who needed it? Slowly, surely, we turned our gaze away. We stayed on the world scene, but with our top three or four hundred players in the pro ranks, world and Olympic titles were just a dream. Yet Father Bauer and Jackie McLeod kept the team competitive in the 60s, with everybody except the Soviets. The Winnipeg-based team was anchored by amateur goalie legend Seth Martin and built on patriotic ideals. The five geographical divisions of our country that we must search for every strand which can bring these together. And certainly, uh, our national game uh, serves a, uh, a very uh, wonderful purpose in, in achieving a Canadian unity. The Soviets of the 60s, on top of their game, with methods alien to us, it was hard to imagine NHL players riding the bus in uniform. Their coaches, Arkady Chernosov and Anatoly Tarasov, a disciplinarian who borrowed from other sports and stressed collective tactics. He drilled the best players year round. Their status confused. If they focused solely on hockey, how could they be amateurs? The fields at Archangelskoye are still used today. Fields where Tarasov hammered his theories home. They say he broke hearts here, crushed men's will. Acceptable in a society that measured success through victory. I taught them that hockey is the essence of their very lives. And accordingly, I explain that everything, 
Absolutely everything I judged about them would come from their behavior during training, not during the game. It was their time, Starshinov, their leader, on the ice. The cruelty in training that is part of the Tarasov legacy was a success. Remember that it resulted in the unprecedented modern hockey phenomenon, Soviet national team. And for 10 or 12 years, we managed to win all of the world's best tournaments. Canada chose to leave international hockey. Winnipeg conceded hosting the 1970 World Tournament. But now the Russians were coming. They'd face Team Canada. Game three, Winnipeg, where fans, spurned by NHL expansion, had a new WHA franchise built around Bobby Hull, the Golden Jet, who could only sit, watch, and wish it were different. I can't, I can't understand that, uh, why the National League has to be so petty over this. I'm, uh, I'm a Canadian, and uh, I think that I should be able to represent my country, and I want to. Number 22, Vyacheslav Anisin. Number 23, Yuri Lebedev. Number 24, Alexander Bodunov. For them, a brand new line. The Big Red Machine's newest prodigies, Anisin, Lebedev, Bodunov. Fresh young legs thrown into the fire by Bobrov and Kulagin. Their debut would be memorable. Winnipeg was supposed to determine the direction the series would take, and in a very real sense, it did. Both teams came out flying. The goalies, Tretjak and Esposito, were hot. Canada struck first. It's another drive by Bill White. J.P. Parise, pride of Smooth Rock Falls. First contribution, more to come. Moments later, a reply from Petrov, one of the players we derisively called Robot. From a Soviet perspective, when the journalists called us robots, it was a great compliment. You must understand that in Russian, the word robot is a derivative of work, hard work. And without a doubt, we were working seriously, like robots, working very hard. Late in the first period. The second period made it clear. Each shift would be a battle. No backing down. This series was going to be a war. Led by warriors like Phil Esposito. The lead was short-lived, an all-too-familiar name stepped forward. And Harlamov goes racing away on a breakaway, coming in on goal. He shoots, he scores! Harlamov came up from nowhere there. Out of nowhere, Valery Harlamov was winning hearts, gaining respect. I don't know how to describe, I don't want to take anything away from stars that I, that I played against here in this country, but he was I would have to rate him as a top player, top five players ever in, the, in hockey. Shades of what would come. Canada's last goal, Paul Henderson. From the face-off, the puck slides into the Canadian zone. 6-18 remaining in the second period. Here's a loose puck for Henderson, right in. That should have done it. 
but two factors became evident. We weren't in top condition yet, and they had Anisin, Lebedev, and Bodinov. With five minutes left in the second period, the newcomers took control. Esposito covering his man. They're bumping there on the side. Lebedev, 23. Here's a shot. And he scores on a carom shot. They dominated that so-called fourth line where the young Soviet players on the, on the rise. And uh, they were outstanding. Puck goes into the corner. It's passed in front. It rolls loose. Here's another pass. Right in front. He's got the score. And they tied it up. Bought enough. The damage was done now. There would be no more two-goal leads. The joyful faces of the kid line told the story. And it showed on our bench. The heart was there, but the body still wasn't. The score remained 4-4 through the final period. We played on pure instinct and raw courage, but the game was slipping away. When chance appeared, Tretiak closed the door. As patterns developed, leaders emerged. This field was really something. If he felt like complaining, he complained. If he felt like yelling, he yelled. It was new to us, his childlike attitude. He didn't hide his emotions as we were taught. He didn't worry about being even-tempered. A 4-4 tie. Nothing settled. There was only one game left at home, and we had to gain an edge. West Coast, game four. The series deadlocked. The fans, nervous. We were not dominating. We were not even winning. Sinden juggled the lineup again. Dryden back. Hadfield back, but brooding. Goldsworthy was in and took an early penalty. Their fearsome power play seized the moment. Recovered by Blinov. Up to center to Petrov. Over the line, he stops. Sinden was seething. So were the fans. Coming up at the blue line, pass on the left wing to Mihailov at center. Over on that point. Four minutes later, Goldsworthy was back in the penalty box. Taking a lead, taking the game, taking our fans. Vancouver, we were never in the game. They, they just, they just took control. And as hard as we tried, we seemed to get a little worse all the time. Vancouver uh, was the game that I'd like to forget and try to block out of my mind. It was a tough game from, from the first drop of the puck. Period two. Anxiety became frustration, and then predictability. We started to run at them, but they were too tough for that. Desperation was the last resort for Team Canada's players. But the Vancouver fans would have none of this style of hockey, nor would the Soviets. What we didn't like in that game was the cruel way the Canadians played. It was unnecessary. We didn't mind the physical style, but that night they were rude and undisciplined. But it wasn't all that way. There were moments of hope. Then a cruel twist. We came back strong to tie it up. Or so it seemed. The goal was disallowed, 
kicked in, the crowd disbelieving. Then, Team Soviet struck like lightning. The fans, you know, they were upset. And, uh, you know, probably rightly so. This is supposed to be the, the team of uh, representing Canada, and you're in your home rink, and you let these guys, uh, you know, walk all over you. You know, they had a right to be upset. And it wasn't over. The crowd's anger reached a peak. Its wrath escaped no one. It, it really hurt us in, in one point because we we Canadian and we try to win. Uh, maybe we play bad that, that night, maybe we deserve to be booed. Our defense was porous. Dryden, the last line. He faced the onrushing tide bravely, but was unsteady. We were being beaten. A disheartened crowd was unforgiving. The pride of our nation was turning to shame. The fans in Vancouver in the rink weren't reacting any differently than uh, several million fans at home in their living rooms. I mean, they were all booing too. And, uh, and we were getting it, and I was getting it, and, um, and they weren't wrong. We mounted attack after attack, but to no avail. The disallowed goal and first period penalties hurt us as much as anything. Anything that is, except the sounds of frustration filling the Coliseum, as the second period closed four to one for them. Phil and I were having to be dressing beside each other. And I mean, we were really ticked off. I mean, you look around the room, and I mean, you just, and then of course you get the pity party going. You know, hey, I've given up my summer, I'm trying my guts out, and we're representing Canada, and they're, I mean, they're booing us. And I mean, it, and it hurt down, I mean, it really did hurt. I says, I hope I'm picked to start a game because I am going to give them a piece of my mind tonight. I've had enough of this. We pressed in the third took the play away, but goals were hard to come by, and Tretiak was there, a constant. Goldsworthy, an act of atonement from Bergman and, of course, Phil Esposito. The coach knew we must cover Phil Esposito. He told me, you are big enough and strong enough to cover him. Easy to say, but hard to do. Then he made the job worse and said, the success of our team depends greatly on you. The logic was solid enough. Shut Phil Esposito down, shut Team Canada down. Petrov was completely at ease, his team supremely confident. Their plan was working. For now, Vancouver victory was at hand. Hull's goal, too little, too late. It ended 5-3. Then Phil got his game star wish. The chorus of boos became fuel for his fire. People across Canada, we tried, we did our best, and uh, for the people that boo us, geez, I, I'm really, I, all of us guys are really disheartened and we're disillusioned and we're disappointed in some of the people. We cannot believe the bad press we've got, uh, the, the booing we've gotten in our own building. Uh, I, honest to God, that just came out. I, 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 to this day, I never saw that until 1981 or 82. People used to tell me about it while I traveled around Canada, but I had never seen and heard what I really said. I'm really disappointed. I am completely disappointed. I cannot believe it. Some of our guys are really, really down in the dumps. We know, we're trying, what the hell? I mean, we're, we're doing the best we can, and uh, they got a good team, and let's face facts. 
but uh, it doesn't mean that we're not giving it our 150 percent because we certainly are. Well, I think, uh, Phil, the disappointment is a natural thing because... And I kept going with Phil as long as he wanted to talk in the mood that he was in. I was going to let him talk because I knew I had a classic. You know, we all live with the National Hockey League. We have all been so proud yeah. over the years how great they are. It's and unexpected because of the press said that we were so good. Or not one of well, us said yeah, we were no, good. No, 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 this is the thing. This is the thing that I'm... I do remember being so frustrated that I almost was on the verge of swearing two or three times. And I do remember Esau just letting it go. And I was hot. And there were a couple of people up in the, in the stands that were throwing things at me. And they were yelling obscenities at me. And he got the whole country to suddenly examine themselves, to understand what they were doing to these players, players who had been working so tremendously hard. I mean, the mo every one of us guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country, and not for any other reason, no other reason. They can throw the money. Uh, for the pension fund out the window, they can throw anything they want out the window. We came because we love Canada. And even though we play in the United States and we earn money in the United States, Canada is still our home, and that's the only reason we come. And I don't think it's fair that we should be booed. Russians were in Moscow getting the hero treatment the morning we left for Stockholm. Sweden would buy time, expose us to the big ice and the European referees in two exhibition games before the series resumed. John Ferguson, Harry Sinden, and Al Eagleson had holes to patch. Too many players, too little time. There was no grand send-off save for a few die-hard fans and their simple telegram. They could feel the support of our nation dwindling but still the team managed to put up a brave front. There was nobody at the airport to see us off. And uh, that sort of gave us an indication that, boys, you've cooked your own goose here, you're on your own. And uh, we had that feeling at that point. Between here and the Soviet Union, Harry and his team would be branded bullies and face a team mutiny. The games in Stockholm turned into brawls. We won and tied against their nationals. The officiating was inept, and some team members were growing more than a little bit restless. Sweden, again, gave us a chance to come together as a team and created an opportunity for the players to get some bitching out of their system. The bitching culminated the night before the first game against the Swedes when one of our senior players, who would play a very important role in Russia three or four days later, came to me with three other... Al uh, has, a, has a knack of, of uh, portraying to the team that you go play hockey, I'll take all the grief for you. And he would do that. He's a very, very loyal individual, which he... After would... about an hour, I let him get it out of their system and agreed with everything they said and then said, now, guys, get one thing straight. The poison's gone, no more yapping, and if any guy in this room doesn't think we can win another game, you better get the hell out of here now. I didn't care one iota about anything. That's all I cared about was winning it, winning. Had to win, had to win. When we went to Sweden, we became close, the guys. We went out uh, in the countryside, we, uh did some benefit games with kids, and uh, the guys really had a chance to uh, know each other. And I also remember the terrible, terrible press we were getting from the Swedish press and from the Canadian press. We were called the Canadian Mafia. We were called the, the Goon Squad. We were, uh, I mean, it only helped to make us a team. Yes, any, anything like that would help unify the club, eh? If you're, get, if you're getting criticized, then it just tightens the group tighter and tighter. And, and so I remember getting on that airplane, and all the guys, it was a different atmosphere. We were cocky. We were really cocky. And it was like, that's it. We're going over there, and we're going to kick buns.
behind enemy lines. A united team now. Vic Hadfield, Martin, and Gouvernon had gone home to their NHL camps. Gilbert Perrault would follow a few days later. No hard feelings. There was a common goal, an enemy to vanquish. Spotlight on the Rushniki Ice Palace, and 3,500 Canadian fans who made the journey. Only four games remained, four chances at redemption. For Canada's team, grim determination hid behind the festivities. And the air was thick once more with tension as our team was introduced. You know, if I had fallen down, or if any of our players had fallen on the ice, we would be humiliated and confused. We would never have reacted the way Gilles Esposito did, like an artist with such elegance. Trejak was in goal. He'd go all the way for them, a giant. Tony Esposito was back for us. He understood their style, this intricate passing game. On the face-off, the Soviet gets a draw. It goes to the side. Gadron shot it in back of the goal. Slid it right front. That's fine. That was a close call there. And Gadron had his shot. Still first period of the Moscow debut. A study in ferocious attack. Ferocious Canadian attack. But Tretiak was first to break. Turnaround. Now they looked overconfident, and we were underdogs, fighting back. Canadians, 3,500 strong. They became a factor in stark contrast to the impassive Moscow bureaucrats who gobbled up the Luzhniki tickets. Nine minutes later, Paul Henderson's star in ascent. He made it 3 nothing. The thrown-together line of Henderson, Clark, and Ellis hit stride. Then, in a moment, it was nearly pulled apart. The defenseman tripped me, and it spun me around, and I was going at full tilt, and uh, I knew I was going to go into the boards. was out cold. Joe Scro, the trainer, told me, came out and he uh, broke uh, three of the uh, ammonia packs under my nose even before I came around. And I was totally out of it. The crowd was gripped in shocked silence, felt most strongly by Paul's wife, Eleanor. My immediate reaction probably was fear. For fear it was a serious injury of the neck or the brain and uh, them not having the facilities here that uh, we were certainly used to, or our standards of medicine weren't, uh, would not be up to par here. Henderson summoned courage as the game went on. By the intermission, he'd made up his mind. You know, I was crying. I said, Harry, you, you've got to let me play. And uh, so he looked at the doctor, and the doctor says, well, you know, he says, I can't stop this, but he says, I'm telling you, you probably should not play. You, you know, you've got a slight concussion. And I said, well, you know, Let's go, and so Harry said okay, and so we went back out. Paul Henderson has returned to the ice for the first time after his injury when he went in the floor. By the time Henderson returned, Blinoff had narrowed the score to three to one, and then... Clark makes a long pass to Henderson. He's in the clear, right in the goal. He scores! Henderson, Ralph Clark, beautiful. Finally, breathing room. A three-goal third-period lead. Then, inexplicably, he stopped skating, and they pounced. Jakushev again took it off the board, centered it, a long It seemed that it was just not meant to be. 
After all, we'd come so far, played so well, and therein lay the hope. Personally, I felt the turning point of the series was game five. I had watched the game carefully, and I went in and, and I was telling the players on the team, boys, I said, we can beat this team. That was the first time that I saw on the ice that we could beat that team. Four goals in five minutes, devastating. It would have been easy to fold right then, right there. There'd be no more goals for Canada. The score remained 5-4 Soviets. Understandably, frustration prevailed. But this would pass. Defeat was simply unacceptable to this team. Probably the best thing that happened was when they won that game, they won the series, and they started to think, we have got it now. And all of a sudden, we got into the corner like cornered rats. So emotionally, in their psyche, that may have been the best thing that happened to us to lose that game. 3,500 rose in unison and cheered our exit. The Russians thought we were beaten, but arrogant pride cuts both ways. Funny thing happened that hot September in Moscow. The Soviets forgot the lessons of Montreal. It showed in their walk and on the ice. This time, we were the ones practicing. Backed as far into the corner as it's possible to get. And they were the ones watching, smiling confidently, certain of victory. The only real concern came from Tretyak and deposed coach Anatoly Tarasov. Moscow was full of hockey talk and puzzled by the behavior of the boisterous Canadian fans. I still am convinced that if we'd been there without fan support, we will never know, but we would have had a tough time winning any games. The Canadian fans were few in number, but they managed to out-cheer our fans. We had never experienced anything like that at home. I felt like I was playing in Canada instead of Moscow. Unlikely, but that's how it was. But the fans were outstanding, and the, the telegrams that we receive, and I, I think we received one with 10,000 names on one telegram. When you'd walk outside, uh, you know, the dressing room, and you'd find telegrams or barrels and barrels of postcards. And that, the Russian guards over there wondering what the heck we were doing, pasting up all these names throughout our dressing room and down the hall. It was fantastic. And you could almost see our players, any time they got down and depressed, you could almost see them glancing at the fans and they found them quickly. Ken Dryden at last showed true form. A rock in a sea of emotion. When you're in the midst of something like this, it's up to those people who are kind of setting the tone of things to offer a bit of a counterbalance. Because what can happen otherwise is that, is that people can go over the edge. You listen to the to the voices of, of people 20 years later talking about you know this kind of series. The passion is still there. Imagine what it was like then. Waving a towel there at that decision. Kirkland is really red hot as you notice. Escobedo is going to get the game. The refs, Bader and Kampala, were terrible. We'd get 31 minutes in penalties to their four. Tempers teetered on the brink. The first period passed with no score. But early in the second, the Soviets broke through. Then we struck. Three goals in a minute and a half. Down for Gilbert at center. Over the line. The shot hit the defenseman. Another chance for Gilbert. A shot by not. Another one. It's gone. Tied it up. It's blocked by. Here's Stapleton getting it away. Back to the net, Barrett. 
and the Chargers. Now then, Canada coming up. It's good to go! They got one more, but Henderson's would be the winner. What came next, though, was a piece of infamy. Clark and Halamov. Watch the stick. Fever, this game is reaching a fever pitch, and they're really hitting each other hard. Peppers are flaring at every... John Ferguson was a tough player. As a coach, he had a tough code. Halamov had incredible skills. He was hurting us all the time, and I called Bobby Clark over to the bench, and, and, I, uh, and I asked Bobby, I said, Bobby, try to tap that ankle of his and break it, and uh, we'll slow him down. He'd give me a pretty good jab with his stick, and I turned around, and I, I knew who it was, and, and the puck started going the other way, and I chased him down, and I just give him a whack across the side of the ankle. And I don't know if it broke his ankle or not. He, he wasn't an effective player. He tried to play after that and wasn't very good. The game reached a boiling point. Kampala and Bader, unfamiliar with the Canadian game, only made it worse. Their version of taking control translated into a steady procession of bodies to our penalty box. The Canadians keep going. Here's a penalty for slashing. And Dennis Powell is going to get the goal. Dennis Howell off for slashing. At times, the game turned vicious. Team Canada was stocked with players used to grueling Stanley Cup series, but the referees and the Soviets were in uncharted territory. The Moscow fans were completely disapproving of the physical Canadian game and voiced their objections loudly. to be sitting there watching your teammates sit on the ice with two minutes and 21 seconds to go, knowing that you only have a one goal lead. This is really the hardest spot game I think I've seen in years. Foster, I can't believe it. Down in that ice, it's just sheer war. These two teams are going at it. They're not sparing the lumber. They're not sparing the body. But is it tough down there in the ice? And Team Canada are giving by far, I feel, the best effort so far in this whole series. We are very emotional type of player. Uh, everything that we do is emotion. And that's the one thing that really kind of give us, give us a little advantage. And we were able to make them feel a little less confident because of, because of the way we played. And, well, we won because of the emotion. 3-2, our first win since Toronto. But that was long ago, at a time when it was still just a game. It's not a game. I just can't help it. That's the way I feel. It's not a game. It wasn't a game. It wasn't a series. It was our society against their society. In those days, the Soviet Union was the big, bad Russian bear, the home of communism, the enemy of democracy. All at the time, I, there was absolutely no question that it was, it was a battle of, of lifestyles or beliefs. It was like the communist country winning over us. A uh, communist country to sending the world a message that our system is better than yours. The grim faces of Luzhniki, game seven. Nothing mattered now save victory. Our food had gone missing, no matter. Surveillance wires in our hotel rooms, no matter. Late night phone calls, no matter. All that counted would unfold here, and hockey, our game, was forever changing in front of our very eyes. Period one. It was beyond a war on ice. It was pure survival. And the puck goes into the corner. They're trying to get into position there. Henderson into Ellis in the corner. A pass right in front of him. Score! Escalito on Ellis. And there's Canada drawing the first blood. Escalito. Canada was about 
to make a change. The play goes right on. The action is coming down fast. Here's Anderson. Into... Each successive game redefined intensity, and always at the center, Phil Esposito. Phil Esposito is saying plenty to the Soviet player who waved him away. It was Mihailov. In this game, neither side would let down. He gets that shot right in that goal right here. He gets the score. Went right in to score. Drawing the goalkeeper out. It's back to Savard. He fakes the shot, turns. There's going to be a penalty call here. Esposito shoots. He scores! Esposito fires that puck and it's all tied up again. All tied up again. Now each shift was critical to success. Here, in the seventh game of a long, hard series, neither team was dominant. And as it happens, the adversaries knew each other well, perhaps much too well. The second period settled nothing. The score was still 2-2. There were 20 minutes left to play. Time was winding down, and both teams knew that if Canada was to take the series, they had to win tonight. Then, with three and a half minutes left, everything exploded. Mikhailov, arms pinned, committed the unpardonable and kicked out, first at Gary Bergman. Bergman, hole kicked through his shin pad, leg bloodied, circled the pack, stalking Mikhailov. Emotion prevailed over common sense at that moment and after that. You know, I have never felt good about it. And if he is watching this interview, I would like to say that I am sorry. I never meant to hurt him and I did not act as a professional. I acted as an amateur. The act cost the Soviet team dearly. Their leader took himself out of the game at the most crucial time. In the dying moments, high emotion had exacted its toll. Some of the guys had real difficulty controlling their emotions, and I think some of them after that series were never the same. Two minutes left. Cue Paul Henderson. I tried to make a little move and lost the puck off the guy's skate. He came over, kicked it in behind, and I felt myself going down, and I looked up, and there was only one place to put it, and that was right under the bar. And boy, it went under the bar, and I'll tell you, one of the greatest feelings. And, and, and you know, when I watch the replay today, I mean, if there's any one goal that I could sit there and watch for two hours, <laughs> it's that goal I scored in the seventh game. Two must-win games, and for Henderson, two game winners. In Moscow's wintry streets, they learned to love the game as we do. So it was for Tretyak the boy, and later, on the fields at Archangelskoye, for Tretyak the young man. So it was in 72. I think that we all learn from each other. And we in Soviet hockey learned a lot from Canadians. 
Canadian players have great talent and battle to the end. Curtain call in the Soviet Union. The dirtiest trick of all saved for game eight. The sounds of O Canada filled the Luzhniki ice hall. Angst and anger filled our hearts. Uwe Dahlberg, our choice of referees, was forced out by Soviet officials. They needed victory that badly. Al Eagleson carried the fight right to game time. I knew it was going to be impossible in those circumstances to get Dahlberg, but I thought we might as well let our team know that we were, they were trying to cheat us again. The Soviets reinstated Kampala, game six incompetent, in spite of the Canadian protest led by Eagleson. 100 million people in two countries paused, ready for hockey's most important game. We finally settled on uh, two referees, Bada and Kampala, and went into the eighth game with hope and fear and all the other things that proved out to be justified. The air in the Moscow arena here is tense as we get ready for this eighth and final game of the series. So if you've been writing the script, it couldn't have been, couldn't have produced a more dramatic and exciting final. Tonight we are making hockey history. It only took two minutes of play for Eagleson's fears to be realized. The referees would be a factor. Canada would fall victim to Kampala's outrageous calls. First, Bill White. Then, Peter Mahovlich. Strange calls had everyone confused and edgy, even the Soviet team. 46 seconds later, with Peter Mahovlich still in the box, Kampala whistled down J.P. Parise. The two-minute minor was only the beginning. I give him two minutes penalty for elbowing. Parise say, say to me, you bloody German referee. I say, okay, I give you two minutes more. The Russian tactic was working. All Canada was infuriated. Our team in apparent disarray. They out and out cheated in that particular aspect of the game. That was not the way the thing was planned. It was not the way it was agreed to. A misconduct call later, and rage consumed Jean-Paul. Maybe sometimes you don't understand who you are. Never would I have realized that I would have, have become such an enraged man for two weeks. Original penalty, interference was the first call. Parise was thrown out. The fans chanted, let's go home. On the bench, Harry ripped into the Soviet officials who'd taken part in the referee switch. Canada, and they'll have two men in the penalty box. The time of the game. And the they were outrageous, outrageous, and uh, we just erupted players and the coaches and everybody. We lost it for there for for a while, uh, but that's not all bad. For the moment, it sparked the team. In spite of it all, the series was deadlocked again. 
On the ice, the struggle ensued, despite injury, injustice, and that constant stream of penalties. The second period, a strange bounce. The netting around the ice helped catapult them into the lead. Into the Soviet zone, Vasiliev cleared in front of his own net. It's grabbed off by Henderson momentarily. Yakushev comes away on the right wing, closes in with his shot wide. It bounced in front of the net. We'd have to come back again. Backing up, takes his shot, is right in front of the door! Bill White deflected it into the net. Bill White from, and the score is all tied up. White. Tretiak played all eight games. Fatigue would take its toll, but not just yet. Gilbert coming in again. Here's a chance, a shot by Rattel went wide. Gilbert fired one across the goal mouth. And Canada has the Soviet on the run here, right in front of the net, a scramble! And Tretiak is down. Hanging on for dear life as they were pouring in on him. And Dryden had his moments too. One man back. Here they're closing in. Mihailov shoots. And Dryden came up for the dazzling save. Here's Petrov. The second period was all Soviet. Their offense, relentless. When Dryden failed, Espo was there. Over on the far wing, here's a fake shot. To clean off the front of the net. He tipped it and rolled in front of the goal. And Dryden was away. But it was only a matter of time. Canada carrying the play at this stage. Here's a roll right in front of the net. Got it. Oh, yes, yes. It's right in front of the net. And there's that deadly shot again from Sosan to give the Soviet a four to three lead. He goes into the corner, is knocked down. Stapleton is going to get a penalty. This time our answer wasn't a goal. Instead, we gave their power play yet another chance and put even more pressure on Ken Dryden. Back on the board. There's that tic-tac-toe passing play. Vasiliev is going to take a shot. There'll be another penalty on the play. They do this for Down by two, dark thoughts crept in. I remember thinking to myself absolutely vividly that I could wake up the next morning the most hated person in Canada. Easily. No problem at all. That's what could happen. Situation critical. Victory remote but not for Phil. I thought we were going to win. And we were walking around. I remember Henderson saying, there's no way they can beat us, guys. And I said, that's right. Let's go out and play our game. We're going to win. We're going to win this game. Let's keep our cool. That was the key. Keep cool when all hell was about to bust loose. room, an all-pervasive, eerie calm. Seven games and two periods after it all began, Team Canada confronted defeat, and in so doing, confronted themselves. I don't think anybody in that room had quit, and it would have been easy for all of them to say, hey, well, we did our best, we came this close, let's just play out the string. But it was obvious there was a degree of anxiety, a feeling of just overwhelming concern and deathly quiet. Outside, deafening noise. Additional militia called in. Their need, protect the advantage. Our need, an early goal. And so it came down to 20 minutes, just 20 more minutes. A time for leaders, a time for heroes. A time for glory. Peter Mahovlich coming down the right wing. Keeps on going into the corner. His bump back of the net. Centered in front. Here's Esposito getting it. Oh! The early goal came at 2.27. All of that was in slow motion. And as I speak about it, it's in slow motion. 
And to me, Peter Mahav was the spark at that moment that our club needed to come back to win. The desire to win produced the most riveting period of hockey ever. It was all on the line. Close play led to rough play. Rough play to a fight. Fighting was new to the Russians, banned in the international game. But here, things were different, desperate, unpredictable. The 10 minute mark, Tretjak and Dryden skated the length of the ice to change ends one last time. Then, with just seven and a half minutes left. An important note, the goal light doesn't go on. That's what started the whole thing. In the crowd, Alan Eagleson noticed the light too, and anger drove him to act, anger that would not be forgotten. At about the 12 minute mark, just after we've changed ends for the teams, Canada scored, and I noticed the referee signaling the goal, but the goal light hadn't got on. I was probably the only one in the rink who knew the goal judge was Victor Dombrowski, a Russian referee who, if he had his chance, I felt would cheat us. I knew I had 3,500 Canadian fans over here who 10 minutes before had been saying, let's go home when we thought we were being cheated. And I said it wasn't going to happen again. I pushed my way down through the fans here. I got to here and jumped over. In this area, there were literally two or 300 Russian militia people who had the good seats, of course. I get down to here, they were wondering what was happening. All I want to do is to get to the timekeeper to tell him to announce the goal. Two militia people get me. One around the neck like this, the other with the arm, and start literally dragging me, and then two or three others joined them and started punching me and dragging me to that exit. Suddenly, thank goodness, I look over here, and here comes big Pete Mahovlich. He reached over, because we're this close to the boards. He hit the one militia man with his stick. He released me. That gave me the chance to push him away, and over from the ice came half the team. And, uh, the Canadian team are all over there. They said, come on, Al, you're coming with us, because the militia men were still looking to get another crack at me. I start to come out here. Now, they've been pushing me around pretty badly, and I remembered I better straighten my tie, and I remember distinctly tucking in my shirt. And I remember my mother, my late mother, telling me she knew I was all right when she saw me tuck in my shirt. When that rump was started, or whatever it was, nobody knows. But Canada tied that score at 12.56, and it appeared to be Cornwallier who got the goal. Bill Goldsworthy is walking across the ice giving this to the Russian fans. Mike Cannon and the rest are giving them this. I'm shaking my thumb at Dombrowski, and I'm saying, hey, Victor, up yours. You're not going to cheat us this time. And I was as mad as can be. I then took my place behind the Team Canada bench. There was a little bench or chair sitting there. I remember standing here, and the team shouting myself hoarse, and I was right here cheering when Paul scored the goal. One last huddle. One last play. And one last Soviet surprise. The next goal will be the key one. Canadian team went into a hospital. 
whistle there, which seems to be a little unusual. So they're really fighting. The puck comes up. A minute left on the clock. And the Soviets had sent one of their delegates over to the bench, and he said to me, we're claiming victory, and the score was tied at that time because we had scored one more goal than you in this series. 102 left in the game. All who watched remember exactly where they were. A hush fell across our land. I really had a sense that I could score a goal. I started yelling at Peter Mohavlic to come off the ice, and for some reason, Peter did come off. Uh, as Peter came over to the bench, I was looking at the play, of course, and as I jumped over the boards, I saw that Yvonne Cornway had the puck at the far boards, and I immediately started yelling Yvonne to the, as hard as I could. The Russian defenseman by this time had come out to reach me, and I fell. As I got up, of course, being aware of the play, I saw that Phil Esposito was going to intercept a pass. And before I even had time to yell at Phil, he just whacked it at Treciak right here. I got the puck, and I tried to immediately shoot it along the ice into the corner of the goal. Treciak stopped it with his pad. right back to me. He was down and out, and I had about a foot to put it in. I turned, and Yvonne Cornway was there, and I jumped into his arms, gave him a bear hug, and then Big Phil came around, and the three of us were there. Part has it on that way. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for Spell. Here's another shot. Right by the side. There were still seconds left. Work to be done before the celebration could begin. Seven remarkable days in September, and it was one. The journey, at last, was over. It is this sense of immense, unbelievable, quiet relief when it's over. It is sitting in your own corner of a dressing room and with a smile on your face. I mean, that's all. And that that is the that is the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful moment that stays. It was going to be easy. It wasn't. It was never supposed to have been this big. It was, and that's what made it so sweet. I was dressing uh, right near uh, Cornway, and I said, Yvonne, you know, I said, is this like the Stanley Cup? He said, this is 10 times better than the Stanley Cup. So I never had a chance to win the Stanley Cup, but I feel like I won, won it 10 times just being a member of Team Canada. All the endured pain was forgotten now. The absolute effort rewarded. True character surfaced and came to the fore. They could not come at the same level emotionally than we did, and that's why we won. You cannot play this game without emotion. From the darkest days, a bond was formed, 
and it carried them. We were so close. We were such a team. And sometimes teams, when you become a team, it beats all the talent in the world. Team Canada, our team. We celebrated that late September day, a new sense of pride, of honor, and the knowing of what it truly meant to be Canadian. Things change. The Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain, gone now. Old enemies can reflect on the series that opened the door. Petrov, Mikhailov, Henderson, the others. Men who were there. Men who know what they gave to their game, to their country, to each other. When history was written in the summit on ice. It will never again be the same as it was in 72. The series with Canada was an historic affair, forever inscribed in the history of the game. It was also critical towards developing hockey throughout Europe and the world. Almost every day of my life, a Canadian will come up to me and shake my hand and say, you know, thank you for one of the greatest thrills of my life. I think that series and, and our team and it did a lot for Canada. Um, when you can, when you have an event that folks who are alive at the time can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing. Nothing will ever, in my opinion, touch this country coast to coast the way September 28, 72 did. And when they played that, that anthem, uh, there was an awful lot of happy people. And I think that's one of the greatest series of all time who brought all of Canada together. Never mind the hockey players the whole country together. Because I think this thing uh, really at that time unified the, uh, the, the, our country. And uh, we'll probably need that right now. Another Team 72. Give me that team that we have and give me a year and a half, I defy anybody to beat us.